everyone, and welcome to our virtual service. We're glad to have you here. If you're joining us at 10 o'clock on Sunday for the premiere, you can use the chat feature to say hello and also to connect with others watching. You can share this service on your own social media pages to invite your friends. Here are this week's announcements. Our devotionals continue every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can find them on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. If you'd like to receive them directly to your email box and be added to our mailing list, simply send an email to madi at shcoc.org. Randy and Jill's Hebrew Bible study continues this Wednesday at 6 o'clock on Zoom. It's a great time of study and fellowship since you can check in with others who are also on Zoom. Everyone can be a part of this as well, so please invite someone to come with you. Email Madi for the invite link to this study. Youth Game Night on Zoom happens on Wednesday at 6 p.m. They had a blast last week, and Madi can't wait to play with everyone again. All students are invited to join in, so email Madi for the invitation to this. The Kids Experience the Bible videos for preschool and elementary schoolers happens at 11 o'clock right after Sunday's service premiere. You can find them on our website or on any of our social media sites. The videos are awesome, and they help you do a child, children's Bible study right at home, all in 15 minutes. And finally, if you are led to give today, you can do so either online on our website, through your bank, by mail, or by dropping it off at the church office after calling ahead to let Brenda know that you're on the way. Don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram for all the church activities 24-7. If you'd like to receive these updates by email, simply send a note to madi at shcoc.org to add yourself to the church mailing list. We're very grateful to have you with us, and we hope you enjoy worshiping with us today. And we hope to see you in person really soon. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art, how great Thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art, how great Thou art When through the woods and forests Glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, and when I think that God his Son not sparing, Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, How great Thou art! How Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all
Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. sometimes ask my sister and I to stand straight and pretend to be a plank of wood. You know, he'd stand behind us and then say, you know, fall back like a wooden board. But don't look back. I'll be right here to catch you. Well, I remember the first time that happened. And I remember I started falling back. As he asked, but then fear set in. <laughs> and I remember feeling my knees bent, and my arms and hands reach back as to break my fall. And as I stumbled backward, I felt him catch me. And you know, he <laughs> he would laugh and say very lovingly, say, uh, okay, let's try this again. This time, don't worry, I'm here. I've got you. I'm not going to let you fall. And these are difficult days where you see that so many storms have erupted. Storms of a pandemic, storms of hardship, 
storms of solitude and violence, storms of hypocrisy and deceit, storms of fear. They seem so unrelenting. Now we may find ourselves in the midst of all these storms in a free fall, an emotional and spiritual free fall. And these are dark and lonely places in our hearts and in our minds. And the, the scriptures, they paint a picture for us about such dark times. And these pictures, however, are lined with hope, comfort, peace. And, you know, in a passage so well known to many, Psalms 23, verse 4 reads, Though I may walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy, or thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And these are not only God's words, but his promises to us, so that we know that he's here. No matter how horrific the storms may seem, he's not going to let us fall. And this was Christ's plea throughout his time here on earth. He encouraged our faith to be bigger than our fear. And he repeated those sentiments over and over again up until his ascension to the heavens, where he promised to be here with us. In Matthew 28, 20, before his ascension, he said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And it is him who we look to because it is his love that sustains us. Not only in these difficult days, but in all the days of our lives. His love will not let us fall. And it is what we commemorate now. His eternal love for all of us. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us so much of your love and mercy. We ask that you bless us and that you open our hearts and our minds to you. We ask that as we take this communion, we do it in, in a manner that's worthy in your sight. We pray these things in Christ. Amen. Good morning, Sunny Hills Church, and everyone who's joining us from social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at our website. We're glad you're here, and today we are looking at the subject of justice. Uh, clearly, that's something that needs to be talked about uh, regarding the current happenings in our nation, and um, <coughs> excuse me. Micah chapter 6 says, What does the Lord require of you? And he tells us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So that's, that's what God requires. He, he wants us to do justice. Now, I want to point out that that's more than just love justice. Loving justice is important. It's, we need to want justice. We need to be people who want to see justice happen. But, but he's asked us to do more than love justice. And more than seek justice. Seeking justice is important. We need to influence as we can those who are responsible for <clears throat> doing justice and, and make sure that we let them know we want to see justice. Seeking justice is very important, and, and it's very good. We need to love justice. We need to seek justice. But what does the Lord require of us? And he says that's that we do justice. So what does that mean to do justice? First, we have to understand what justice means. Um, we might say to someone, 
a, a, a woman might say to her girlfriend, uh, that makeup really does justice to your features, does justice. Uh, somebody might say about a, a chef, uh, this limited menu doesn't really do justice to your cooking abilities. Uh, we understand uh, doing justice has to do with, with, with making things right, making right, doing rightly, restoring what's right. Uh, these are all the things that uh, have to do with what justice means. Justice, the word just and right are basically from the Greek word dikaios, and from that we get justification and righteousness, all kinds of words like that that have to do with right. What's right? And uh, so we want to do justice. And um, there's a there's a number of churches of Christ that are involved this Sunday on this message. Uh, it's a unity thing where people are all joining in this message, a core message of justice, and they they just want to speak one thing. And uh, it, there's a there's a little verse up here that sort of reminds us about unity, and it's from Amos chapter three, and it says, "Do two walk together unless they." be agreed is I think how I remember the King James Version. Um, and first I want to say that that's a passage that's been really misunderstood and taken out of context. Uh, people have used it to say that you cannot walk together with someone else in some venture unless you agree about everything. And so some people in, in religious communities will say unless you agree with us about everything you you can't walk with us in our religious stuff. And, and that is just obviously not true. Um, anybody who's married knows this. Uh, Jill and I have been walking together uh, going on 23 years and we don't agree about anything. Okay, well, something. <laughs> uh, that's a little hyperbolic, but, but you know what I mean. We make a life together. We agree about important things, but there's a lot of things we just don't agree about. But we walk together. Uh, the Sunny Hills Church is, is filled with different beliefs, different ideologies uh, about, about what the Bible says, about politics, about social structures, about all kinds of things. We All kinds of ways that we have differing beliefs of things and uh, about things. And <clears throat> but we work hand in hand. We love and serve in the name of Jesus together. Uh, and so we, we are able to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, even if we don't agree about everything. So what does Amos mean when he says, do two walk together unless they be agreed? Well, it's just a rhetorical question. Um, there's several rhetorical questions here in Amos chapter 3. He says, uh, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in a thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he's caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground? where no snare has been set? Does a trap spring up from the earth when there's no, no nothing in it to catch? When a trumpet sounds in a city, don't the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? All of these are just rhetorical questions. And, and the question, do two walk together unless they be agreed? It's simply saying, will Jill and Randy meet at the church building at 11.30 on Tuesday to walk down to the subway to get a foot-long sandwich to share for lunch so they can save a few bucks. Yes. <laughs> that won't happen unless they've agreed to do so. Will, will it happen if they haven't agreed? No. You see? It's just a simple statement. Th things, uh, you just know this won't happen if, if you haven't agreed to make it happen. And, uh, and the point of, in Amos is there's so much injustice in their communities. Whole communities are being captured and sold into slavery. The business practices are, are disenfranchising people and the poor. Uh, there's, there's rampant immorality and, and there's all kinds of, of evil in and among them. And even though they're sacrificing all their, their sacrifices and having their celebrations and their feasts and, their, and all their religious stuff, Amos is saying, look, if you continue to behave unjustly to people, it doesn't matter how re much religious stuff you do, if you continue to disenfranchise people and treat them as less than in the image of God, less than children of God, if you continue to do that, 
will God do nothing? <laughs> no, God won't do nothing. God's going to do something. And he did in that same century. In 721, God brought Assyria down and carried off the ten tribes, dispersed them in the world. So, will God do nothing? No, God's not going to do nothing. He'll do something. But it's still a good verse for us to look at. Do two walk together unless they be agreed? I, I want to still look at that and say, if we do agree, then we can. We will. If Jill and I make that appointment to go to lunch, we will. And let's talk about what Micah tells us God requires. God requires to do justice, to love mercy, walk humbly with our God. If we agree that we want to be on that path together. Will we do it? Well, yeah. See, if we can agree that we need to do that. Uh, but first, if we need to agree about point A, we have to agree where we're going to meet. We have to agree on a point A, and then we have to agree on a point B. Where are we going? Where are we meeting and where are we going? And so our point A today when we're thinking about meeting together on a journey toward justice, toward doing justice, our point A has to be a recognition that there is systemic injustice that has to be dealt with. And then we can, if we agree on that, then we can seek out a point B where we can work toward doing justice, bringing about justice. Now. Some people have a problem talking about systemic injustice. So let me just at least make it clear what I mean by it. Because systemic prejudice, let's talk about. Systemic prejudice doesn't mean every single person or part of the system is prejudice. Systemic means it's not just a local problem. What we see in police departments is not just a local problem. It's just not LAPD that might have a problem or Chicago or it's, it's not localized. It's a problem in many police departments around the nation. And then it's not just in police departments. There's prejudice in the court systems in some places, in the system, throughout the system, not just localized. And there's prejudice in companies, in businesses, in government. There's, there's prejudices throughout the system. Doesn't mean everybody's prejudiced. I mean, I, I'm not prejudiced, or at least I'm doing my best to open my eyes to however I might be. But it means that there's a systemic problem. It, it just means it's system-wide. And, and we need to address it. So that has to be point A, that there's a system-wide problem. And then we can start walking toward point B and doing justice and bringing about what Jesus wants to see in, in community. In order to show that this is what Jesus' ministry was about, I want to point out that there was systemic prejudice, which brings about injustice. There was systemic prejudice in the community Jesus came to. It was systemic. And when we think about that, we might think about, well, like racial prejudice, sort of like, well, what they think about Samaritans? Well, they were half-breeds, right? Like, stay away from them. Avoid their entire town of Samaria as you go north or, or, or you're headed south, whichever way you're going. Just go around that because don't want to hang around them. Prejudice. Or Romans. Dogs. They don't have the law. They, they're not even human. That's, that's prejudice. And so what did Jesus do to handle that prejudice? Well, he told stories where Samaritans were the heroes and nobody liked that. He told stories where Gentiles, like, this, like the, uh, the centurion, where he said, I have not found this kind of faith in all of Israel. How do we think people responded to that? They, they, they were not happy about Gentiles. They didn't like the Romans. And they didn't like the Samaritans. You might remember when Jesus began his ministry and he talked about two stories where, where God healed 
a leprous Gentile. And where God uh, uh, took care of the widow of Zarephath's through uh, Elisha or Elijah. I get those confused right now. Um, but the point is, she, a Gentile, a Canaanite even. He told those two stories, and in response to that, they wanted to throw him off a cliff. They didn't like thinking that way. It, the, the whole mentality was, those are not real people. They don't count. Their lives don't matter. But it's more than that. It's not just prejudice against the half-breed Samaritan or the Gentile dog. It's not just that prejudice. It's even deeper than that in, in their system. You remember when the disciples came to Jesus and they say, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? that he should be born blind. What does that mean? What are they thinking? How are they thinking about this man and his family? You see, if you're a good Jewish family and things are going pretty well for you and you think, eh, you know, God really is showing his kindness to you, he's blessing you, and then there's that family down the street or across the tracks and they have this situation where they're blind or leprous or lame or deaf or mute or paralyzed or poor and clearly under God's punishment. Don't hang out with them. They're, they're getting what they deserve. They're, the wrath of God is on them and so we just, we just don't want to, that influence around us. This is systemic prejudice. And so Jesus' ministry is, he, we're going to see a couple examples, he sets about to fix that, to do justice in those situations, to restore those who are treated as less than human, as though their lives don't matter. He wants to restore them to a place, not only of dignity, but in the community. That's, that's, what, that's what he wants to happen. But I wanna say it's not just these, these, this way of thinking about those who are in some kind of pain or suffering that God's mad at them. It's not just them. In, it, it's in all the way they think about who God is and, and how he thinks about them as opposed to others. There's prejudice. When, when uh, Peter confessed Jesus was the Messiah and then, and then Jesus started telling Peter that, and the other disciples that he was going to die and be rejected and, and crucified or they were going to kill him. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him and said, that's not right. That's not how it works. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Now, we shouldn't think that Satan just jumped into Peter all of a sudden and he was saying things he didn't mean. Peter was communicating a way of thinking that everybody thought in his world. Everybody in his community and the people he hangs out with, they all thought, that God was for the Gentiles. I mean, excuse me. God was against the Gentiles for the Jews. And the Messiah was for the Jews and coming for the Jews. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Satan was in all of that way of thinking that treated people as less than human, as less than those who matter. And so, Jesus' is point A in Mark chapter 3. Jesus is point A. He's, he's healing a, a man who has an evil spirit. And he's accused by the religious leaders. They tell him, you cast out demon by the prince of demons. And his explanation after saying, well, that's dumb. That doesn't really work if Satan casts out Satan. But after doing that, he tells a little story, a parable maybe, a little story about uh, if... if if you're going to go into a strong man's house and take his stuff, then first you have to bind or tie up the strong man. And what he's saying is, the strong man, being Satan, has captured 
people. He's got them. He's got them trapped in all of these ways of thinking that don't do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God, but that are corrupt and prejudiced and filled with injustice. John Free brought up in our Wednesday night Bible study. Just take a look at uh, the religious leadership in dealing with Jesus and, uh, and how they brought the charges and, and, and how they treated his ministry and, and ultimately what they called for and what they did to him. All of that corruption had nothing to do with justice, had nothing to do with loving mercy and walking humbly with God. Fully corrupt system, but it wasn't just in those who were obviously corrupt. It was systemic. It was through everybody. And not everybody knew it. It might be easy to see in others, but it's hard to see in ourselves. And so Jesus says, first we've got to tie up that, that strong man. Then we can take everything out of his house. And he's saying that he's come to bind up Satan, to stop Satan, to, to tie him up so he could free the rest of us to get us out of Satan's control. And, and this is not just about people who will have what they had, thought were evil spirits or demon possession. It's not just about that. We see it in Peter. We see it in all the disciples where clearly they have bought into a mentality that is prejudice, that is unjust or unjust. I'm thinking about the story where the disciples, uh, they, they wouldn't allow a Syrophoenician woman to come to Jesus. Everybody else, all the Jews, anybody's hurting or needing help, they bring to Jesus, bring to Jesus. One time they brought a whole bunch of people to Jesus in the morning, but he had already left. He'd gone over there to pray and he wasn't coming back to the area. So, But they, they want to bring people to Jesus until it was a Canaanite. They didn't want to bring her to Jesus. It wasn't until she pestered them so much. He said, oh, they, she's driving us nuts. Do something about it. And in my view, Jesus quotes back to them this prejudice. Well, I've only come to the lost house of Israel. It's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. This is, this is the mentality of the Jews. Now, I know it's not Jesus because, number one, the gospel tells us he came for all, all people. This is tidings of great joy for all people. And number two, right after he says that, he goes into the Gentile regions and helps everybody. He, he clearly came for them too. But he says it because he's, he's saying, basically, I, th I thought you guys, I thought our thing was we don't help them. Now you're asking me to help her. Oh, because it's convenient for you? He was just pointing out, he was holding up a mirror to their prejudice. But, um, so it's systemic. It's in them. They don't know it. And so that's got to be point A. We've got to understand that this is a problem. It's a point A. And now we have to decide we want to go to point B. We have an idea that there is injustice. There's systemic injustice. There's prejudice. We have ways of thinking about people. Maybe not me or you, or maybe we don't understand we do. But clearly it's in the system enough around us that, that, that people are experiencing that they don't matter or they don't matter as much. And we don't want that. Jesus didn't want that. Jesus did things to make sure people didn't feel that. When they felt it, he did what he could to take that away and give them a better way of feeling. The Samaritan woman who was at the well, uh, after talking with her, she maybe she was isolating herself. It doesn't. Maybe the community wasn't the one that, you know, dismissed her. Either way, she was isolating herself or they were isolating her. She wasn't around them. But after an encounter with Jesus, she's forgotten all that stuff and now she goes running into her community. She's restored to her community. And now she's even one of the best gospel preachers. <laughs> she's preaching Jesus to her community. She's restored. But what about, I want to think about the leper. Jesus, in, in, uh, in Mark, Jesus encounters a leper. And and he goes to heal the leper. Now, he could heal the leper from across the street. He could heal the leper from the next town. But he chooses to go and touch the leper. Now, think about this. Think, let's say you and I are there. Let's, let's put it in today's terms. You're, uh, you're with your church. You've, you've gathered with social distancing, and there's a house across the street where a bunch of people have COVID-19, and, and they're coughing up a storm, and some are dying, and some are on ventilators, and... and uh, but you're praying because you want to pray for those people in that house and, and, and your pastor or your minister or your preacher, whatever you call him, uh, all of a sudden he starts walking toward that house and you're like, wait a minute, hey, whoa, we're, 
Hey, we were just going to stay over here. Let's, we, you can't go over there, remember? But he's going. And he goes over there, and, then, and you think, oh, maybe he'll stop on the sidewalk. But no, he, he goes up on the porch. And what are you thinking? This is crazy. You, you know, you're getting so close that we can't even be around you for 14 days. I mean, you got to stop there. But then he goes up on the porch, and he, he knocks on the door. And they open it up and you can see inside there's people and there's a person laying in a bed there coughing up a storm and, and he walks in and now it's, that's it, now it's over, okay? Now he's not coming back to this group, you know, right? 14 days. And, and hopefully he, he didn't catch it because then what? Then he's down for however long, maybe he's dead. But he goes in and he goes up to that bed and maybe he touches the COVID-19 patient or maybe he kisses him on the forehead while the, the person's coughing and coughing. And what are we all thinking? Oh, uh, he just ruined his ministry, maybe his life. Or something like that. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying? That's how everybody must have been feeling when they saw Jesus walking up to this leper. Is it, it's all over. Why did he do it? Why didn't he just heal him from far away? Because this leper it has, has been disenfranchised from community and ha hasn't had human contact, at least not with anybody clean, <coughs> for however long he's had leprosy. And he couldn't get involved in the community uh, religious services. He couldn't, couldn't be around much of his family or friends, anybody who doesn't have leprosy. He just, he's just disenfranchised and, and, and cut off from community. But, but when Jesus touches him, and, and instead of Jesus getting infected, who, who Jesus is infects the person, he heals him. And the man becomes clean right in front of everybody's sight. At that point, at least it seems to me, there's no question that this man has been restored. I imagine Jesus, after touching that leper and he's all clean, I imagine there could have been a hug line among people. If Jesus is, is, is holding his hand or hugging him, he probably hugged Jesus. I would, wouldn't you? But I imagine there could be a hug line now. If Jesus just said, oh, you're healed, now go show the priest, I'm not sure there's a hug line there. But Jesus is restoring the man, not only his body, but he's restoring <coughs> his humanity. He's, he's causing people to see him as a whole person, as a person loved by God, not hated the way they thought, not cursed, but loved. And this happens again with the woman who is bleeding that Leanne did a great job talking about in her devotional last week. If you haven't seen that, go see it. But she touches his garment. She's already healed. Jesus is on his way to help an important religious official, uh, synagogue leader. Let's go help him. His daughter's on the verge of death. That's the most important thing right now. That guy's daughter, he's important. That means she's important. This woman who's unclean and been unclean for 12 years because of bleeding, not really that important. She doesn't even see herself as important. She doesn't even want to disturb them because she knows those guys are important. So she just kind of tries to touch his garment. And the power went out. He knew somebody had been healed. He knew it. And he could have just pressed on. Why stop? It's already healed. He wanted more than that. He didn't want this person thinking they were less than human. He didn't want this person thinking that her life didn't matter. It was important for Jesus, for this woman to believe her life mattered. So much so that he stops the procession. For what? She's already healed. He stops it. And he says, who touched me? Which is crazy. Everybody's thronging him. But he knows what he's talking about. And the woman confesses. And everybody sees this, this woman who's been unclean for 12 years. And now she's clean. But not only that, Jesus has stopped to talk to her. Stop this urgent procession that's going to help this man's daughter who's important. And Jesus stops. And he says to her, daughter. He calls her daughter. The only person Jesus ever called daughter. There were others called daughters of Jerusalem. But this is the person Jesus calls daughter. You think that guy's daughter is important? You're important, daughter. I love Jesus. You're important, daughter. You're important. You who think that your life doesn't matter. You're important. Jesus wants you to know that. And so he heals her, but he not only heals her, he restores her to community. He lets every, everyone know her life matters. She's important. 
This is his ministry. This is what Jesus is about. And I like to think about it. His, his spirit, his power, it's infectious. It's more contagious than COVID-19. When he touches a leper, he doesn't get infected. He infects the leper with him, with his power. <coughs> when the woman touches his cloak of the, the edge of his garment, he doesn't become unclean. She becomes clean. He's the one that's contagious. His power, his mercy, his, his doing justice is contagious. He wants it to be contagious. And I love the scene at the end of his ministry because it's part of the commission of his, his disciples, you and me. This is, this is him saying point B is out there and I want you to get there. <coughs> you remember when it says, Then he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. He infected them. And we can see that because they become a community of faith that's restorative of justice. It's concerned about the disenfranchised. It's raising up those who who are of humble circumstances, who are poor, who are destitute. It's raising them up and letting them know they're important too. It's one community that in Acts 2 that says that they were, they were just so much about loving and serving one another that the whole world, and I know I mentioned this last week or the week before, I don't know, but that, that everyone around them had favor with them because they could see the Spirit of God in what they were doing. They were becoming like Jesus. They were building a community that had the spirit of Jesus. That's point B. Can we get there? Only if we agree. Only if we agree that there's a point A. That means there is a problem with prejudice and injustice. And that we are called by God to be doers of justice and to make that right. And then to meet together. Not physically, but ideologically, to meet together in a combined effort to move our nation, our populace, our government, our communities toward that point B, where people are restored to the understanding that their lives do matter. Their lives matter so much that God gave his one and only son so whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's how much li their lives matter. That's how much every life matters. And if we are not treating people like that, God help us. I hope this message was meaningful for you this morning. I think I went a little bit long, but I apologize for that. Uh, God bless you. Pray, pray, pray for justice and do justice in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good morning. We want to include another uh, element um, to each Sunday service. So we wanted to have a shepherd's prayer. So if you have a request, uh, make sure Brenda knows and um, we'll be sure to include it each week. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, holy, holy is your name. We pray as a church, as, a, as families, as individuals, that we're leave, living out your kingdom uh, to those that we um, come in contact with every day, our, our family, uh, those we work with, um, and that we're always submitting our will to your will. Father, we pray for uh, members of the church, for Burl, We've seen that his family, that his daughter, son and daughter, Debbie and Gary have brought him home. And often that, that uh, is an indicator, but we pray that whatever happens in his life in the next several days, that your peace is on that family, that your spirit is in that home, and that whether he can speak at this point or not, that his his uh, conviction of where his faith has always lied um, still permeates the walls of his house. 
We pray for Dot. Um, and we pray that uh, we understand the struggles that she's having. And we pray that you give her some good days, some days where she is uh, she's up and, uh, and she is enjoying the life around her. Um, and we pray for Sari that you give her strength to, uh, to care for Dot. We pray for Seth Royal. And we pray that you give him uh, a purpose, a sense that, that his life isn't over, even though he's lost, um, lost a foot. And we know that for a young boy, for anybody, that would be difficult. For a young boy, that would be even, even harder. That you not let him get caught up into, I don't know, any kind of depression. That you will, that you will encourage him. That you will bring voices into his life that will tell him that he does have a future, and that uh, he will hear from you. That he, that uh, the same message that you gave Jeremiah. And we pray for Gail Roberts, Jonathan's wife, daughter of Sam and Nancy. We know that she is uh, will be going through cancer treatment soon, and that you will um, you will bring healing to her body, that you will be bring strength to the family, and uh, you will bring peace over their home. We pray for every family uh, as we're separated from for such a distance that uh, that we continue to be an extended family, even though we may not see each other. And um, we pray for comfort, and we pray for your spirit to be on every home. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Goodbye. Hope to see you soon.